Yeah. Okay, welcome everyone. We're, we're trying to increase our production values here with a beautiful floodlight. <laughs> so um, I wanted to bring out Alec uh, Proudfoot and we're going to talk about the uh, dead simple human powered airplane. So he's going to talk about how he got together with a group of engineers together and he's going to also talk a little bit about the history of flight, if I can uh, queue up the YouTube videos correctly, but I think you'll find it pretty interesting. Uh, he sent me some images before the talk and uh, he's building this wingspan of a human-powered plane, uh, about the wingspan of a 737, and it's about the weight of a person. So it's pretty half, light. Half a person. Half a person. Okay. <laughs> and I noticed a lot of his build techniques are the same as ours, so I'm really excited about the things we can learn, and we have some things to show, too. So, um, Alec, I'll do the cue. Great. Great. Um, yeah, it really is just a gigantic uh, model airplane, so that's kind of cool. Uh, I'm going to go pretty fast through the history of human-powered airplanes and stuff so that we can um, get into the building. But uh, if there's anything, if I'm going too fast, let me know. And if there's something you want to go back and look at, let me know. Go ahead. Next. So I'm going to go talk about the motivation for the project, a brief history of human-powered airplanes, talk about the design considerations and specifications, and then I'm going to go into construction details. I've got a lot of show-and-tell stuff and talk have lots of questions and stuff. So I basically did this just for the fun of it. Uh, <clears throat> I've been interested in human-powered airplanes for many years since I was a preteen, and uh, I was in pretty good cycling shape a few years ago and realized I wasn't getting any younger. And I started this thing called the Google Workshops at Google where we could do um, our own fun projects after work. And we just moved into a much bigger building and I wanted to start a, a some sort of fun project. So I came up with a few project ideas, and this was one of them, and that's what I went with. Um, next. So going back a little bit about motivation, when I worked at Air Environment, this airplane was sitting over my head. We'll get that, uh, get back to that in a minute. But that's that's sort of one of the motivating factors. Next. Uh, so going back further, uh, in high school, we had this free period. And I would wander around and look for interesting books in the library. And I found this book. This was a book by somebody who uh, built a human-powered airplane that flew for a few hundred feet uh, in the mid-70s. It was before the Kramer Prize had been won. But it was a really cool book. It had all these um, equations in it. The equations weren't that hard. And I realized, hey, this is something I could do, but not when I was you know, 15 or whatever. Next. Uh, and then a few years later, the uh, Paul McCready uh, team Brian Allen, pilot, won the Kramer Prize. Next. And uh, a few years after that, well, quite a few years after that, about 10 years after that, I went to work for Air Environment, for Paul McCready at Air Environment, on the electric car project, the GM Impact, which was the follow-on to the GM Sunracer, and was the prototype for the GM EV1, which is sort of the grandfather of all the electric mm -hmm. vehicles that are out now, the Tesla, the Leaf, everything else. So this is us in the Mesa Proving Grounds in Arizona with the original prototype, which was painted overnight so that it looked good on the outside. If you look really closely, it's still uh, bare fiberglass on the inside. Next. Uh, while I was working on that project at Air Environment, as I said before, this airplane, the Bionic Bat, was over our heads. We were in you know, something with maybe a ceiling one and a half times as tall as this, and it was hanging up there, at least parts of it were. And uh, we were working 16, 18 hour days to get this car done for the LA Auto Show in 1990. And we were always threatening to take it down and, take, and fix it up and take it out to the desert and fly it, but it never happened. Next. It's just another picture of it. Next. So I'm going to go over all this history. Don't have to read that. Next. <laughs> uh, a really good site if you're interested in learning more about human powered airplanes is this propdesigner.co.uk site. They have all sorts of history. They've got a great book by Chris Roper, the guy who uh, built the Jupiter airplane that we'll see slides of in a minute in video. Um, and they have pictures and history on just about every human-powered airplane up until like the mid to late 80s and then it's body or since then. They don't really have a lot of information on the Birdman rally that, that I'll talk about more later. And then the McCready photos are from this Donald Monroe gallery. Next. So going way back in early history, you know, people were thinking about this for a long, long time. So this is back from the 15th century, Leonardo da Vinci idea, 
of a human powered plane. As you'll learn in a little bit, this is the span is way too little. <laughs> um, and the power by the arms is not the greatest way to power it, but you know, people were thinking about it way back then. Next. Um, the first real attempt at doing human powered flight uh, was the Peugeot Prize. It was the early 1900s by the car company Peugeot. And um, it was pretty simple, it seemed pretty simple. All they had to do was go 10 meters under human power. So what they did was they created things like this. This was you know, only a couple decades after the safety bicycle was invented. So they take a regular bicycle, put a good cyclist on it, and have some wings at zero angle attack ride as fast as they could, and then have some sort of spring-loaded thing that they do to pop up to a positive angle attack and try to hop up in the air. No propeller on there to try to extend the flight. This is not necessarily the one that won the prize, but it actually took 17 years for the prize to get won. It was a 5,000 franc prize. Where, where did I put my drink? I have a bad throat now. <clears throat> uh, so, yeah, it took 17 years to win the prize, but somebody finally won it. It was about 5,000 francs, which is about $50,000 in real dollars today. It's a reasonably sized prize. I think they did this out of the Bois de Boulogne or something, one of the big, big parks in Paris. And periodically, they would go out and a bunch of people would try it. Next. In the interwar period between World War I and World War II, some, um, a few people in, I think, Austria and Italy, or maybe Germany and Italy, I'm not sure, tried, uh, made a couple human-powered planes. They were sort of a sailplane design, very heavy, like 250, 300 pounds. They had to be bungee launched. And um, they claimed, although there was never really any confirmation, that they held level for a while under human power. Next. In the late 50s, uh, Henry Kramer, a British industrialist who was interested in physical fitness and flight, came up with a, a prize along with the Royal Aeronautic Society, which helped write the rules, to prove you know, that real human-powered flight had happened. And they did a figure-eight course with a half-mile spacing between the pylons to show that you actually had controllable flight and you could turn in both directions. So the flight in the air was probably like 1.2, 1.3 miles. And it started out as a 5,000-pound prize with British subjects only, 10,000 pounds. Then they opened it up internationally, 25,000 pounds. Eventually, it went up to 50,000 pounds. Next. And as soon as that came out, that started spurring people to, to actually build planes that fl flew. So just a couple of years later, the very first verified takeoff on its own power human powered airplane, Sumpak, flew. And it, was, uh, it flew for several hundred yards, I think, straight. Again, it was pretty heavy, very much built in sort of sailplane fashion. Next. That was built by a, a, a university, and then <clears throat> De Havilland Aircraft Corp built this, this airplane, uh, the Puffin, next, which also flew. You can see that these early human-powered airplanes, they all thought it was necessary to have a drive on the ground wheel. So they're all using full-size bicycle wheels, that have, and the transmission was going both through that and through the propeller. Turns out you don't need to do that, and that's a bunch of extra wasted weight and inefficiency in the drivetrain. Next. This is another one called Dumbo, next. It changed its name to Mercury later. Next. Go back a couple. Just notice how floppy the looking those wings are. And these are really, really long, you know, very high spec ratio wings. Next, next. So this really shows you what sort of the state of the art of human powered airplanes in the in the early to mid 70s was. <coughs> all wood construction, incredibly intricate, all built up. Um, thousands and thousands of parts. This airplane took 10 years to build, partly because he like had a nervous breakdown and quit building it after five or six years. Um, and then he donated it to somebody else who then got him back involved with the project and they finished it up pretty quickly in a year or two and flew it. Um, but it really shows sort of the challenges and the problems with the approach that everybody was taking. I mean, this is how they knew how to build airplanes. But if that thing crashes, after taking 10 years to build and maybe you know three or four years of really hard work, then you've got another year to fix it. Next. It, is, it was very successful, however. Um, the first human-powered airplane to fly for one kilometer. Next. Okay, so now we're going to try to see if the video works. And remember to turn the audio up a little. 
So this is going to have some pictures of both Sim Simpac, should be the first one on the left, yeah, and you can uh, full screen it. Audio? What did you design? You tried to compensate by emulating the wood and 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 gliders, but they were working with wood and ended up with small, heavy planes that soon exhausted their violence. This is from a they documentary called Light Stuff. You can watch the whole thing on YouTube. Sunpack made the first human power takeoff in 1961. In 1962, a plane called Puffin flew 993 yards, and the record stood for 10 years. It was beaten in 1972 by Jupiter, a heavier but aerodynamically cleaner design piloted by a strong athlete. But it couldn't turn very well. Okay, you turn the audio down. Control down. has always been a problem for HPA because they fly so slowly. So this shows the... Now that wasn't, wasn't too bad, but it probably had enough damage. It took a, you can stop the video now. Probably took a few weeks to um, fix. And they had worse crashes where like the whole wing would crumple up and then it would take them you know, six months or a year to fix. Uh, okay, go back to the presentation, please. <laughs> Next. So just going through really quickly some other ones. This was Toucan, a, a two-person plane next, which flew. But um, it just makes it harder because now you have a bigger bending moment on the wing. They should have span-loaded it with the people in separate po pods. Excuse me, next. In Japan, they had a bunch of airplanes, next. There's a whole series of these Lynette airplanes. Next. I'm not quite sure why they did such a short couple tail. Next. Now this one is the first one to go a mile. And they also started doing 90 degree turns and people were starting to think, hey, maybe these guys are actually going to complete that Kramer prize. At that time, the 50,000 pound prize was worth about, uh, what would be about $250,000 in real dollars today. Um, next. Another version of the Stork with Winglets on it, basically. Next. Another really big airplane. Next. People try to do things like this uh, inflatable airplane. There was another one called Just the Phoenix that followed after this that had a thousand square feet of wing area that flew, but it was so light wing loading that any puff of wind and the thing would just blow around. This one was way too short of a wingspan. Next. This was a uh, Taurus Kucinic who did the Icarus uh, hang glider, the early hang gliding. He named all his airplanes Icarus. He tried to make one that took advantage of ground effect. The idea here was at the start of the Kramer Prize and at the, uh, course and at the end you had to be 10 feet high, but then as long as you didn't touch the ground in between, you could be any height at all. So the idea was here was to pedal really hard, pop up to 10 feet, and then come back down and flying ground effect all the way. But it didn't work that well, and because of the way they constructed it, it wasn't that easy to modify, which we'll find out is important. Next. So this is what finally did it. Paul McCready, who invented the McCready speed ring, you guys probably are pretty familiar with him. Uh, he was an international, national and international soaring champion. He um, was an aerodynamicist, PhD from Caltech, and had a company called Aerovironment. And he'd also been involved in the early hang gliding days um, when it, they were started out as regal wings, and then the wings started to get bigger and bigger. And he realized if he took a hang glider and expanded the span by three times and kept the weight the same, it would take about a third of a horsepower to fly, which is about what a really fit cyclist could do for the five or 10 or 15 minutes. You just hang that up. Red to green. There you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, it's about what a really good uh, fit pilot can do. So, um, sorry, that's my... <laughs> They're calling my number that also makes my uh, computer ring. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so he thought, this, this sort of brings in the concept of the McCready factor. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it. The, the difference between his optimistic outlook on how long it would take to do something and how long it would really take to do something. He thought that they could put together, fly, and win the Kramer Prize based on this hang glider, expanded hang glider idea of his in three weeks. In the, in the, end, in the end, it took... Uh, it took uh, basically exactly a year, so his McCready factor was about 15 or something like that. Um, my McCready factor on my airplane project is about four right now because I thought it would take us a year and we're four years into it and we're just about ready to fly. 
Uh, so anyway, you can see how different this is. And we'll maybe go to the next picture. This gives you a bigger, better idea of, of what it's like. Now go back to the last picture. Tons and tons of wires everywhere. How can he get away with having this very unclean design when you saw, you know, the one that did the best, Jupiter, up to a certain point in the mid-70s, um, was very clean? Because he has tons more wing area, so it's flying a lot slower. And the power due to the drag of those wires goes with the cube of the airspeed. So the difference between flying at 15 or 20 miles an hour and flying at 10 miles an hour like this airplane did <laughs> meant that you could have lift wires all over the place and it didn't matter because they still were a small fraction of the overall drag of the plane. Next. Mm -hmm. Next. So, oh, back, go back. Sorry. So this, the first one was a single surface plane, all wrinkly mylar. Um, it had a weird design where it had a, a free-flying canard that did both yaw and pitch, so it, it banked to do yaw. No other vertical surface, except sometimes they tried putting a little bit of vertical mylar up there. And they tried all sorts of weird flappy things and stuff on the wingtips to try to turn, but they didn't really, weren't really able to turn, but it did only take them a week or so to build this thing, and it did fly right away. And pretty soon, even with this version, they had you know, a few minutes of flight. Uh, um, next. So they, re they realized over the t course of developing this that the they needed to clean it up. They turned it into a double surface wing. They fared the pilot. And next, eventually, a year later, uh, they switched pilots to somebody who's an actual pilot in addition to being a good cyclist. And they worked really hard to figure out how to turn this thing. This thing turned really strangely. They realized that because of the very, very light wing loading and the big apparent mass of the wing, that the ailerons were really just drag devices. They, they did wing warping, not ailerons. And so what they did is they used the aileron to keep the wing up on the inside of the turn and skid it around the turn in the opposite direction. So they used the canard to pull them over, and then they used the, the aileron or wing warping for drag. Next. So then Kramer came up and said that was awesome. That was the biggest aviation prize at the time. They won it. Um, let's make an even bigger prize. It's what really hard. That took 17 years to win as well. Let's. Uh, Let's make something that's going to take another 10 or 15 or 20 years to win. So let's make a challenge to do human-powered flight across the English Channel. Well, they just kept building airplanes, changed their spar to carbon fiber, decreased the wing area so they could fly faster. MIT, including Bob, I think was part of the team, redesigned their propeller for them uh, for better efficiency. And they were able to, with the stronger spar, get rid of about half of the wires. And next. In less than two years, they flew across the English Channel on the first try, 22 miles. By far the longest thing. You can see this propeller is different from the one in the previous one. That's the MIT design propeller. Next. So uh, it was a very harrowing flight. They found that the drag down low was really high, and when they went up higher to try to hook in and drag him in and try some other day, he found that it was much lighter. Uh, much lower power, and so he kept going, but he, he sort of reached his physical exhaustion limit and got all cramped up and everything, and just barely made it. Next. Next. And as soon as this picture was taken right afterwards, somebody held onto a wire and broke the wing. This is very, very fragile. Next. So then Kramer did this speed prize where you're allowed to store power for 10 minutes, and then add that to human power and do a two-mile tri triangle and the fastest one get one 20,000 pounds, and then you, every 5% that you broke uh, the record by, you could win another 5,000 pounds. So this was McCready's uh, effort, and they thought they won it, but they had not done the battery storage right, so they were disqualified. Next. Next. And then the MIT guys built a similar hybrid airplane with electric storage. Basically, there's a little electric motor that operates as a generator. You store energy in a battery, and then you add that along with the uh, human power to, to go as fast as you can. So they won the first prize. And then the two ping pong back and forth, resetting the prize. And then next, this guy, actually this guy's brother, built this all human powered airplane that beat both of them. Next. Next. Then they built a second one that uh, went even faster. And the, the, the record now stands with that airplane at about 30 miles on this course. And it was. This crazy banked flight at like 25 or 30 degree bank turn with the wing just about hitting the ground. 
obviously using thermal energy in addition to human energy to, to go around. Now based on this, the Royal Aeronautic Society set a bunch of new pri Kramer prizes assuming that this was an easily achievable thing, what this guy did in this flight. So they have this marathon prize, which is 26 miles in an hour. I've done the math, and I think the only way you can do that is, is with a gigantic span-loaded three-person plane. Um, and they also came up with a sporting prize where you're supposed to be able to put together and take apart an airplane in like an hour or something and be able to go average 22 miles an hour over an hour in two directions. It just just ridiculously high when you look at the, the actual math for this stuff. So I think in, in some ways it, this is a very inspiring flight, but it kind of pushed human powered flight into this weird zone that's sort of hard, if not impossible, to achieve, where I think what we should be doing is trying to make it a lot easier to fly, even if you're flying slower, and make it fun for more people to fly. Next. So the MIT guys, after doing the Monarch, there wasn't any standing prize, but they wanted to do uh, the you know, sort of the ultimate human-powered airplane. Bob's probably talked about this, so I'll go over it quickly, but recreate the flight of Daedalus and Icarus from Crete to Greece. They made three airplanes, a prototype and two competition planes, if you want to call them that. Next. And on their first flight, after waiting for about six weeks through gale force winds, on the first actual attempt, uh, they won the prize. And this is the, by far the longest human-powered flight, 115 kilometers um, 71 and a half miles and it's just under four hours duration. Next. These days the big action in human powered airplanes is in these competitions. This is the Birdman competition in Japan. It's not like the fluke talk thing that happens here that's a real joke where people just throw these art projects off things. This is like serious, you know, engineering schools build real human powered airplanes and fly them off this uh, 10 meter ramp. I was, this is my photograph. I was there in 2012 as we were building our plane. I wanted to learn more. Uh, they have a speed prize where they go out 500 meters and back, and then they have a distance prize. Um, the longest distance they've ever done is 38 meters, and they have some pretty nice planes, or 38 uh, kilometers. Some pretty nice planes, but I think the reason why is that when I was there, it was uh, 98 degrees Fahrenheit and 100% humidity. Mm -hmm. So it's, they've got beautiful airplanes, and they have a very poor condition, because uh, they always do this in the middle to end of August or early September, very poor conditions for pilot performance. Next. And the really sad thing oh. is that <laughs> this is, even if the airplane lands gently in the water, all the airplanes land in the water, they, somebody so. comes up with a jet ski, hangs onto the tail boom, and then drags it back through the water. And this is the end result of basically every airplane. Sort of like a zen sand sculpture. You build it and then it, you destroy, destroy it right away. Um, I, most of the teams carry on year after year after year with new sets of students. And I don't know if they reuse any of the carbon fiber parts, but they certainly don't reuse any of the foam or mylar or anything else. They, they, they do typically tend to rebuild sort of a, a new updated version of a plane from the year before. Next. The latest thing in human-powered flight was the Sikorsky Prize, which was a very long-standing prize. I think it was 25 or 30 years. It was a really big prize, $250,000, and it's much harder to build a human-powered helicopter than an airplane. Uh, you're, you're basically in your own wake. And um, all you had to do was fly for a minute, stay within a 30-foot by 30-foot box, and, and reach 10 feet altitude at one point during the flight. But it took years and years for this to happen, and then finally, University of Maryland and these guys, former University of Toronto people called Aerovelo, built these huge quadcopters. Aerovelo's was a lot bigger than Maryland's, but they started, the record had stood at like 19 seconds and six inches off the ground for years and years, and they started doing, you know, flights of 30 seconds, 40 seconds, over a minute, and then shorter flights all the way up to eight, nine, ten feet. And so these guys eventually linked it together and did the whole thing. Next. So we're going to try video again here. Is that from the beginning? Uh, yeah, from the beginning on this one. And full screen it. Thank you. You can turn it up. So this is done inside a huge um, indoor soccer stadium in Toronto somewhere. <clears throat> and 
it's kind of interesting that they used a bike frame as a center because it seems like that's not the most efficient way of doing it. But the rest of the uh, structure is a very efficient structure. I think the whole air, the whole helicopter only weighed like 60 or 70 pounds. Which is ridiculous. They know they only have to go for a minute, so they have about a minute and five seconds worth of spool, spooled up stuff. And you guys should watch, um, go on YouTube and watch other uh, videos of this because a couple times he got about that high and then the whole thing collapsed and he fell down to the ground. It was very, very dramatic. It just was very much on the edge in terms of the structural things. And the controls, they used to have hand controls and then they changed, and they used to have these little flaps on the, on the rotors and then they changed the way they control it. I'm not sure how they control it now except that I do know that there are lines going to the bike, so you'll start to see him start to lean, and that's an attempt to try to keep it in the square. He barely, barely kept it in the square to keep it legal on the when he fly it. So what's that mechanism? What? It's all that string mechanism. What is that? The, the cone-shaped mechanism at the bottom of each rotor. That's the spool on the rotor end that, I, I don't know if you saw at the start of the video, uh, don't go back to the presentation yet, oh, um, th that, uh, that um, lines up with the, the, you know, basically what's the, the um, sprocket on the, on the crank. And that, that sprocket on the crank has all four lines coming into it, so it's the take-up so reel. So that's like a pulley. Yeah, it's a take-up reel for all these Vectran lines, and then they're, they're, they start on, the, on those big things on the rotors, and then he's doing this, and they're all getting taken up and pull, pulling the rotors. And like I said, they have a, like a minute five or a minute ten seconds worth of line because they know that they only have to go for, so they have to spool up for a few seconds to take off, and then they have exactly the amount they need to, to go for the right length of time. Oh, geez. Okay, uh, so go to the next video. So just to see, get an idea of um, what you've probably seen this part, if you phone screen if you can. So this is just a little bit of video of Daedalus to get an idea of what a human-powered airplane looks like flying. Are you ready for takeoff this time? He cut holes in his uh, bike shorts as a joke, just to lighten up the plane even more. The Daedalus weighed 67 pounds and 113 foot wingspan. And again, this is from that light stuff video which you can watch in five, there's five parts on YouTube. So it was a Nova special. Now you'll notice, he takes off on a cliff, it's kind of hard to tell, but he's on like a 200 foot cliff. And then he, he slowly drifts down a little bit, but he stays at about 50 feet above the ground. So just like the Gossamer Albatross people, he's, uh, this team found but both over land and especially over water, if they had any sort of wind at all, there's this weird inverse ground effect when you have these really, really light wing-loaded planes where it actually gets, the power gets higher um, closer to the ground rather than lower. So he stayed at really good 50 feet the whole, the whole flight, basically half a wingspan. Awesome. There he's probably at the entire wingspan. He hasn't come all the way down. Okay, you can uh, pause that video and then go to the next one. I just added this one to the presentation a few hours ago. I was just in Korea, and they just started a competition kind of like the Birdman Rally. Their, their NASA is called CARI for the Korean Aerospace Research Institute. And uh, they had 14 teams. The goal was to have somebody fly 400 meters. This isn't the record flight, but this is a pretty good flight that ends kind of spectacularly. Um, the goal was to have somebody go 400 meters, and the first two years they didn't. But then, in this year, somebody finally went about 470, 480 meters, and so they, they broke it. This is uh, one of the other really decent planes. But notice how they don't have a pilot fairing it. I've done the math, and they're really penalizing themselves here because um, you can see he's trying to adjust the right, but it keeps uh, going back. I think he was having an electrical problem. This is all RC. Oh, there you mm. have a turn. Oh. Oh. oh! Now they had, it looks bad, but they had that fixed and flying again the next day. It actually, all, it didn't break the spar, it just... Oh, you can stop. Um, uh, it, it just stripped about seven ribs off of the spar, but it didn't actually break the spar. There was another one that I have, which we can watch later after the presentation, if people want to watch more of these videos. 
There's also an antenna pole next to the runway. It ran into that and, and all the guy wires coming down and broke both of the wings off and these huge carbon fiber shards. They had that fixed in, that night and flying again the next day too. It's pretty impressive. Okay, we can go back to the presentation now. Um, but anyway, so yeah, the, because they don't have a pilot fairing, it adds like a third or more to the drag um, and really uh, limits them in terms of <laughs> their performance. And the human power, you know, you've got this aerobic part of the, the power, we'll see the curve in a minute in my presentation, and then you've got a, an aerobic part and an anaerobic part. And they, because they have that much extra drag, they're really in the anaerobic part of the curve. So the guy that went 470 meters, he was completely exhausted because he didn't have a pilot fairing. If they, and they also don't have, their wingspans are not quite long enough. Um, it makes a huge difference. You really need to decrease the induced drag and have um, uh, you know, low, low drag on the fuselage. Next. Okay, next. So the constraints we had, DASH stands for Dead Simple Human Powered Airplane. I had this idea we would build a really quick and easy human powered airplane just to get something fun to fly, but then I tried to design too good of a one. Um, but I still tried to keep it simple. I wanted to design it for field assembly. I wanted a 2.5 G structural limit. Daedalus was 1.75 Gs for 170 pound pilot, or 2.5 Gs for 200 pounds. Because I want the people on the project to be able to try to fly it and have the thing be pretty robust so if it hits a wing tip, it just doesn't break. Daedalus actually broke when they got into high winds at the landing beach and fell into the water about 20 feet short. You can see that in that video too online. Uh, it still was a record flight, so everybody was happy. Uh, so we're heavier because of that. Uh, our dimensions are constrained by material sizes, so things end up being four feet sometimes because that's what stuff at Home Depot comes in. Yeah. Um, and I wanted a normal person to be able to fly for a few minutes and an athletic cyclist for longer. And I wanted it to cost the same or less than a moderately expensive luxury car. I've since taken to calling this my Tesla, since that's about what I've spent on the project. <laughs> I'm, I'm basically funding it myself, um, but we've had uh, sponsors that have donated some materials and. Uh, We've had free workspace donated, something I'll talk about more later. Next. So we try to keep it simple, do only what was necessary. Classic aerodynamics. I designed it in metric because it bugged me that we switched to metric and then switched back. Uh, try to keep the weight to a minimum. And the big thing is build on previous HPA successes and get advice from HPA pioneers, i.e. Bob Parks and friends. And uh, the Arrowell guys gave us a lot of advice on, on tools and bu buildings, since they've just they built a human powered ornithopter as well. I don't know if you guys have seen the video of that. This is amazing. Um, we did full FEA on it and did an efficient pro propeller design, and then we prototyped everything and weighed everything and then iterated. So, like our first year and a half was just building samples of everything before we really started building the airplane. Next. We didn't do panel codes, CFD, stability analysis. We knew that it was basically the same size and shape as other HPAs. And we didn't do airfoil design. We copied the Daedalus airfoils. Next. Oh, we didn't use ailerons either. It's a two-axis plane, just for simplicity and weight's sake. Uh, I've already talked about this. Next. So the challenge is humans a lousy engine. You have to make it really light, but you have to make it really light, and because a human allows the engine, you have to have a huge wingspan to keep the induced drag down. So it's this big trade-off between weight and uh, wing size. Next. So, and we had a decision to make. Do we want to um, build something slow and draggy like the Gossamer Condor with tons and tons of wires? Or, next, did we want to build something more like the Daedalus where it comes apart in a bunch of pieces and it only has one lift wire to save a little bit of spar weight in the middle? Next. Skip that. I just went over that. Next. Uh, what we had, I made a spreadsheet. Uh, started out with like this many cells and turned out to be something that's like 10 of these long with an altitude model and all sorts of equations for the weight and everything else. Um, and played around with it and figured out what I wanted the plan form to be next. And later, after I kind of intuitively figured it out by trying a bunch of numbers, I went back and used the paper that Juan Cruz of the Devil's Project did with formulas to predict what an HPA would weigh based on different wingspans and configurations. 
and I plugged that into my spreadsheet and did this calculation next and made up these curves for different wing areas over here uh, and wing spans and plugging in the weight from that formula for the, what the weight of it was and using our heaviest pilot, 200 pound pilot, 300 watts is about the most you can put out and still be an aerobic flight. So this is where you have to be if you want to have really, really long flights. Everybody, I went to this human powered airplane rally in England and also the thing in Korea, everybody seems to be obsessed with keeping their human powered airplanes small, which is exactly the wrong thing to do. And this, sh this curve shows why. It doesn't really matter a whole lot which, how much wing area you have, that just governs how slow or fast you fly and what your um, speed is going to be. But they all have to be over 30 meters in order to get down to the place where you're going to um, actually be able to fly for long periods of time like the Daedalus did. Daedalus was like right around here. We picked a point just a couple feet shorter. And then we made versions of our plane that go all the way up to here. Next, 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 just different ways of looking at the same curve. So we did kind of a weird combination of uh, low tech and high tech. We're trying to do this fast. We did finite elements on all, all of the tubes, which just required modeling the tubes by themselves, but not the whole airplane together. So for a long time, our, our drawing, engineering drawings were things like this, next, this, next, this, next. Um, and we made two uh, drawing templates, one with a straight tube and one with a tube with taper at the end, and just put different dimensions on it in order to order the tubes. Um, we, we bought our tubes from a uh, spar manufacturer in um, uh, New Zealand that makes sailboat masts. This, these tubes were the, by far the thinnest tubes they've ever made. You know, they're used to making stuff with 15, 20, 25 layers in them, and we're making tubes with two layers in them. Mm -hmm. And they're really worried that when they pulled them off the mandrels, they would just come apart. And a couple times they did, but most of the time they managed to pull it off. Next. Eventually we did do a solid model, we're still working on that, not finished, next. This is just a close up of what the uh, fuselage kind of looks like, next. And this is a three view of the airplane. <coughs> I always think that I should get a laser pointer and then I forget to do it. Um, it it's very Daedalus-like. Uh, that's the decision we made, was to make something much more like Daedalus than like Gossamer Condor, which didn't really have any way of coming apart and transporting was really important. So this comes apart in five sections. Each section is 6.7 meters long. It's 33.3 meter wingspan, uh, 100, about 110 feet. And then we made longer outer wing sections that would go, it's a little bit hard to see, but they go to the red there. That makes it 37 meter span. And then you can add a little extra um, 1.5 meter extension, which is that thing right behind you guys over there. It's not covered yet, but that's one of the wingtip extensions that brings it all the way up to 40 meters. It's going to be a weaker wing because it's this you know similar weight but bigger bending moment and less maneuverable, but it will definitely bring the induced drag down and make it flyable if it turns out it's not flyable at the nominal 33 meters. Next, this just gives you an idea of how big that wingspan is. Next. Uh, it just happens to be that it's the exact same wing plan form as the Voyager, which I discovered when I was back there in April. Uh, basically identi identical, but just a coincidence, this was about a 9,500 pound airplane. Our airplane target weight is 80 pounds. I think we're going to come out at about 85. Next. Uh, so basic spar construction is two layers at about a 45 degree angle for torsion. This is 0.2 millimeter thick carbon fiber built up on an aluminum mandrel with in between those two layers multiple, uh, multiple layers of unidirectional fiber down the top and bottom as a spar cap. And it varies from eight layers uh, in the middle to one at the tip. I forgot to bring all of my show and tell stuff up. Can you guys pass all that stuff right behind you up, up here? And then I'll start passing it around. This is where we get into the part that's probably more interesting. Um, yeah, just all the little things and then fake stuff you can still leave there. So this is uh, part of the main spar here. And piece that I actually sanded carefully uh, 
got lost somewhere. So be really careful with this because there's you know carbon fiber splinter potential. So hold it in the middle. But you can see when you look at it, it's very very thin on most of it, and then there's this big lump in the middle, which is the spar caps. Next. Uh, so this is the you know normally the way it would be in reality they actually feather these in by shifting them over a little bit and they have shrink tape around the outside so it makes a smooth transition it looks more like a smooth lump than an abrupt uh, stress inducing transition next next so this is just a FEA result from the um, the main spar, and you can see everywhere you see this little notch, that's where there's a transition to a different number of um, spar cap layers. And then the big transition here is where the lift wire is relieving a lot of the load. That lift wire takes about eight watts of power to fly, but it's, it's uh, getting rid of about eight kilograms of weight, which is enough to save about over 20 um, watts. Next. And this gives you an idea of how light it is. That's uh, one of the outer wing spars that I'm balancing on one finger. Next. So oh, we've gone over some of this, but basically max pilot weight is 90 kilograms, about 200 pounds. The target weight for the plane is 80. I've, we've now built most of the parts of the plane, and it's coming in closer to 85, 86, something like that. Um, again, it's heavier than the Devil Switch was 67 because it's designed for... Uh, more G's. Um, and the, just the interesting thing here is, so a heavy pilot like me, I'm close to the maximum weight, is going to be about 300 watts, and a really lightweight pilot is 200 watts, and a middleweight pilot is somewhere in the middle. But it actually scales really well so that if you look at the watts per kilogram of the pilot based on their own weight, it's just about exactly 3.35 watts per kilogram no matter what the pilot weight is. Next. So this is just quickly showing the design of this part, which is the lift wire clamp that gets glued and lashed onto the wing. I'll show this, uh, hand this around. This is, most of this airplane is built with very simple techniques, and, and uh, it's very much like building a model airplane, but we have a few fancy machine parts on the plane, and this is a four-axis machine piece. Um, I'll hand it around. Uh, so next started off with hand sketches of what this might look like and did some simple straight beam bending calculations to get the right order of magnitude next. Modeled it up in SolidWorks next. Uh, made a 3D printed part to make sure that the sailing thimble we were using for the wire termination fit around next. Mo modeled that, uh, or did FEA in SolidWorks next. Redesigned the thing to save weight in SolidWorks next and then did a um, FEA on the contact stress as well to make sure we weren't going to have a failure there next. And then this is just some pictures machining the part next and the finished part which we're passing around next. Uh, avionics, I'm not going to talk about that much except to say the main thing that matters is our airspeed and altitude. We have an ultrasonic altimeter uh, for the altitude, you know, basically like the thing that was in the um, Polaroid camera rangefinder thing. And uh, we have a, pitot tubes don't work at the speeds that we're, we're flying at. Even the pitot tubes designed for model airplanes are really not designed for the speeds as slow as we're going. So they just don't have enough resolution. So we actually built our own little impeller style airspeed indicator uh, using a model airplane prop um, and neodymium magnets on each prop blade and a Hall effect sensor. And then that goes into an Arduino, which then broadcasts by Bluetooth to our CPU display, which is the phone back there that was ringing a little while ago. So it's just an Android phone about that big. Everything feeds in with Bluetooth and Ant Plus. Next. Uh, we'll also have uh, voice communication to the pilot, assuming that we end up making a good enough plane and can fly for long periods of time. We haven't picked off the radio for that yet. And we're going to have telemetry to that phone, either using over-the-air phone or Wi-Fi or some other kind of radio for longer distance than when we're out in the desert. Next. And the controls, two axis. Almost everything on the slide is wrong, so go to the next slide and I'll just tell you what it is. Uh, it's basically um, 
we decided to go with a 2.4 gigahertz radio after <laughs> wanting to do something different before. We're using servo control, so we don't have the benefit of feedback, but we do have the benefit of not having any problems with cable stretch. Dettles had one crash that was basically due to cable stretch where they, they only got about half of their normal deflection and they couldn't get out of a, a thermal induced um, spiral turn. Uh, we've done a ton of testing on ways to build stuff. Like I said, we spent a year, year and a half just figuring out how to build stuff before we built the real thing. And then we tested the control system. We'll show a video of that in a minute. Um, next. And we've got more testing to do. We're, we were going to, on Sunday, do our load test at Hiller Museum, but some of the machine parts for the uh, wing connection brackets weren't finished. So that's got pushed forward two weeks. So if you guys want to come help or come watch, we'll be at Hiller Museum uh, during the day from October 26th through 28th, loading up our wing spar with a bunch of two liter bottles of water to make sure that it doesn't break. <laughs> and also to get the lift wire dialed in so we get the right dihedral. Uh, next. So this is, we also tested pilots, next, on bikes with power meters. And this is sort of this typical human power curve I'm talking about. This is sort of a pseudo logarithmic plot and this is linear. This is our 3.3, 3.35 watts per kilogram line. And you can see a lot of people cannot fly for very long. They can fly for a fraction of a minute. But some people can do okay. I happen, this happened to be one of my runs. So I should be able to fly the plane for five or 10 minutes. Um, I'm gonna do the first test flights because A, I paid for it, and B, uh, <laughs> I'm an okay cyclist, and I'm also a pilot that's flown a lot of different kinds of airplanes. All the really good cyclists that we've got, like this guy, the purple one, have never flown before. So actually in this last month, we've been taking them up on sailplane flights, and we've also set up a flight simulator with the dynamics of our airplane that they can try uh, so they get a little chance. So we're hoping they get enough, you know, the basic thing is do they react the right thing if the airplane is turning, do they turn the right way? So we're trying to teach that to them. But I'll find out how hard it is to fly when I fly it. Hopefully, the dynamics in turning are very slow. In pitch, they're a little faster, so hopefully it'll be easy enough to fly, they'll be able to fly it. But you can see on this guy, that this is going to asymptote out to basically a flat line with his aerobic capacity. If he has enough food, water, and rest, he can fly for hours and hours. And we have about a half dozen people, uh, men, who, who we identified that can do that. And we finally just got a couple of good female pilots that uh, also uh, can fly well. And the female record, if we're going to set any records, which you know we, we'll be happy if the thing just flies, but if we're going to set any records, the female record is only 10 miles and 37 minutes, so it's actually pretty achievable. Next. So we tried a pitot tube. This was messing around with our early uh, avionics next. And this is the, uh, the model airplane prop with the, the Hall effect sensor I was talking about next. And this is our test rig for that next. Uh, this is testing of the tail surfaces. So we made a, this is a one, uh, it's full scale cord and uh, about a fifth span. And then we made something for uh, the vertical tail, which I didn't bring, which is um, a bigger cord, but basically the same area, which is a third span. They're both just a meter long. And we tested these on this rig. We went to a higher airspeed to give equivalent forces in the, in the control horns and servos to make sure that all worked. And then we did the same thing with the real tail surfaces. We've got the real tail surfaces fully built, but they're just way too big for me to bring in my car. Now this guy, is more than half the weight of the full tail surface that's almost five times longer than it, just because it has aluminum in it instead of carbon fiber. Um, when we're done, and I'm done talking and people are milling around, everybody should carefully, since that's a real part of the airplane, pick that thing up to get an idea of how light the wings are. Um, so next. So we built several different props. The first one was a old timey built up prop with, I used aluminum because I didn't have carbon fiber spars designed yet uh, for the, the main spars and then balsa wood and spruce secondary spars. It works great. We've been using it in a test uh, rig ever since. Then we built a bigger, larger diameter prop with this huge cord. Um, and we didn't have our engineered carbon fiber uh, prop spars yet that have had the um, spar caps. So we bought a similarly weighted set of 
uh, ski poles and built this as a test, but then it's like, well, this looks like it can probably work. So go to the video and I'll show you what happened when we tested this. I think it's probably the fifth one over, right there, yeah. Oh no, this, play this one first. This is, this is that test, uh, the built up one that I'm talking about. And this, this, our test rig is basically the same geometry as the real fuselage frame. And you can start to see that it really blows a bunch of wind around. The interesting thing is, Maybe you guys will know, yeah. you're airplane guys. Um, how much thrust do you think that it takes to fly this plane? In pounds or kilograms, I don't care which. You can stop the video. Maybe 15 pounds? Eight pounds. Eight, okay. Eight pounds to fly this 110 foot wingspan airplane. Okay, uh, next video. 15 will get you in a good climb. <laughs> So this is what happened when we didn't engineer the spars and just tried to use something that would not my word. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we were smart enough not to have somebody standing in the plane of the prop. Uh, okay, uh, back to the presentation. Next. Next. Um, so, I'm just going to go over a bunch of construction details, ask as many questions as you want, interrupt me, whatever. Next. Uh, we started out by building our work tables. We were in a really sweet building that Google had at the time that was big enough to fully assemble the plane in. We only had that building for a few months before they started using it for something else, unfortunately. Next. This is our built-up prop that you just saw on the test rig. Next. Finished. Next. That's about 1,250 grams with a, with a aluminum spar. It would have been about 800 grams with a carbon fiber spar. Wow. Uh, then we built the test rig. Next. Uh, we've already seen that. Next. And then the second propeller we built by laser cutting these um, things. And next. Gluing them on the end of foam blocks with the right twist, you know, linear twist in between each section to give the complex twist shape. Next. And then we glued them all together and then put very lightweight, I think it was 1.4 ounce fiberglass on it. And we, uh, on this one that you're going to see over there, we actually have a combination of 1.4 and 0.7 ounce. Next, that's the two. Now, notice this humongous cord this thing has. This was EPS foam, you know, one pound, slightly less than one pound foam. And each propeller blade weighed 750 grams. And we wanted the whole propeller to weigh maybe 750 to 1,000 grams. So we redesigned the prop. It's using an efficient prop theory you know, program, um, but we sped up the RPM by about 20%, and that brought the cord down to about half, so the internal volume to about a quarter and the surface area of the covering to about half. Next. And this is a uh, test milling of that piece and some CAD models of that new propeller. Next. And then this is actual parts of the new propeller. We used a, a spider foam for this. I think I got the last spider foam in the United States that was for sale from ACP. Because I haven't been able to find it anywhere else. I've called all around. And um, ACP didn't have it after I bought their last batch out. If you guys know where spider foam is, again, let me know. Because if we want to make another prop. Now all we can use is Dow High Load. And this stuff comes in 5.5 inch thicknesses. And Dow High Load only comes in 3 inches. So we had, by, in 5.5 inches, we had to split it up into two pieces. If, if we made it out of three, we would have to split it up into three pieces to fit all the twists of the propeller. And on the inner larger chunk, we actually pocketed it out just to save an extra 50 grams or so on the blade. Next. Uh, then we, we now have our <laughs> properly engineered spar, which we did this weight test. This is similar to what we're going to do on the full-size spar in a couple weeks for the wing. Next. And then this is all the pieces together, ready to get glued together. Next. This is the gluing process. Next. Uh, then the fiberglassing process. Next. And that's not yet trimmed on the trailing edge, but drawing. And we've now since trimmed it and um, sanded it. We're gonna, there's a couple little bubbles that have to get re-epoxied and fixed. And we'll do some final sanding, and then we'll just paint, sand, paint, sand, paint, sand a bunch of times 
until we get it nice and smooth. But that's our, our real one of our real prop blades that you guys can look at later next. Uh, we did we did some TIG welding. We're going to make a really lightweight seat next. We eventually oh, I didn't should have brought the seat. We eventually made it out of using the lashing technique. Let me show you that. Um, so the way we hold together all our carbon fiber parts, copied from the Daedalus guys, taught to us by Bob, is um, you put a little balsa wood plug in here, you cut out the fish mouth shape. All the balsa wood is for is just to give you tacking area to glue it together, you let it dry overnight, and then you lash it together with Kevlar and then infuse that with epoxy. It makes an incredibly strong light bond. So I did the same thing on much smaller diameter tubing with the seat and that worked great and now we don't really have any time to make a welded version of the seat so I think we're going to go with the last seat. Be careful, there's some spur, uh, burrs on the end of some of those tubes so don't cut yourself. Next, uh, oh these are these are the uh, parts in New Zealand and then arriving in Oakland and me picking up with my old hang gliding truck. Next, uh, next we talked about that already. This is all the parts to make two complete airplanes plus two extra sets of wingtips sitting on the wall and on that table. This is all the fuselage parts, and that's all the wing parts. Next. The way we build the, I'm going to just show some show tell parts here. We use a hot wire to cut out each wing shape. This is one of the root cord uh, airfoils. One of the ways we try to keep it simple is have a constant cord for three-fifths of the wing and only have unique tapered airfoils at the end. So we have a lot of these airfoils and then we have a few, uh, about 20 unique airfoils on the wing. Um, and then after we do that, we take this very, very thin 0.4 millimeter plywood. You guys are probably more familiar with, with this than the you know, 20 or 30 other audiences I've talked to. And we laminate that like this guy, I'll pass that around, on, onto here, and then we saw it out. Um, you notice that we have this jog here. That jog is, because this is a laminar flow airfoil and we don't want to get scalloping in between and have some unknown airfoil in between. So we cover it with Depron, 65% on the top and 15% on the bottom. And so the jog is to make room for, um, for the Depron. And you have to be really careful with this. Um, so this, this is the basic way the wing goes together, except that these are carbon fiber pieces instead of uh, aluminum pieces in the room. Uh, so to make that jog, we made these tools um, and used ammonia to loosen up the wood, uh, put it in there. It took 36 hours to dry because it, there's nowhere for the moisture to go. So I bought a panini maker and I stuck the metal on the panini maker and heated it up and then it only took three hours to dry. So our airplane is made with a panini maker. Next. <laughs> uh, this is just showing the lamination process. We, we tried a bunch of different kind of glues. We ended up using polyurethane glue. Uh, it was definitely the best, the lightest, and had the best adhesion. That was Bob's suggestion again. Next. Uh, this is polyurethane glue. Uh, so we use, so there's Gorilla Glue is the one that people yeah. typically use, but we actually use the um, Elmer's version of it, just because it was a little less viscous and we wanted to be able to spread it out as thin as possible. And then Osh quit carrying that a few months ago, but we were able to still order it online. So I'll, I'll throw the, uh, pass this around too, just so you can see that. Um, next. Uh, so this is cutting out the ribs. You can go. To, there's a video of it if you want to see it. I don't think. I don't think we really. We'll watch more videos at the end. It's not a big deal. Next. Next. Uh, we laser cut out all the doublers. I think I brought one of the finished ribs. To, oh yeah, there it is. So you can pass that around. So you can see the the rib is pretty floppy side to side, but it's still pretty strong in, in this direction, and that's all we're really asking it to do, because it's got the tension of the mylar on each side of holding it, and it's it gets strong enough with that doubler there. Next, to hold on the spar. So this is just a few slides. Uh, next, 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 showing the ribs under construction. Next. And then you cut out, you use the, the doubler itself as the template for cutting out the, uh, with the hot knife the, for the spar hole. Next. Next. 
And then the <coughs> trailing edge is made out of Kevlar with a Rojas L core. Again, very lightweight Kevlar. So we cut it out to the right angle and everything. Next. Next. Uh, this was some tests of some short pieces. Eventually we built them in eight foot long sections. Next. There's an eight foot long section. Next. Uh, we make them in sets of four. And then we use the Kev Kevlar shears, which complain a little bit, especially when we have a double nut patch, but we're able to get through the, the cured stuff with the, with the electric Kevlar shears and separate them out. Next. Uh, this is just showing me put together this thing. Next. It shows how that kind of fits into the little notch here. Uh, this, is, this is one where it actually fits really, really nice. They don't always fit that nice, so that often there's kind of a little gap and a glob of glue, but oh well. Next. Uh, and then we vacuum bag, um, these, are, these are actually end ribs. So the end ribs have to take up all the tension of the mylar, right? On either side of a rib in the middle, it's basically equal tension on either side, but you have to take up that tension somewhere. So the end ribs are actually white foam, they're an inch thick, and they fully sheeted with 16th inch balsa, and then sheeted on the top afterwards with the, um, with the, the 0.4 millimeter plywood so that we have the biggest glue bond we can get. And then we back and bag everything. Next. Uh, we built up a complete dummy wing section just to practice all these techniques and try different materials and stuff. And this is the start of that, and I think it's out of order because later you'll see more pictures of that. Next. This is our hot wire machine that we did all the root ribs on, and then we got to borrow a larger hot wire machine and another company to do the unique ribs with all the different sizes, so we do five at once. Next. That's after cutting it out. Next. We tried doing experiments using heat guns to bend the Depron. It made really crappy, um, pointy leading edges like this one. And so I should have brought an example of good leading edge, but uh, we came up with a hot bath technique that worked a lot better. Next, next, next. So this is the hot bath technique. This is actually making a leading edge for one of the tail surfaces, which were made the same way. Next. What's in the bath? It's just water. Just water. Yeah. Water, and we have two heater cores. We heat it up to right around boiling. It seems like the stuff will bend down to about 94, 95 C, but if it gets anything below that, it's too cool. Um, and even with those two heater cores, we probably should have added one or two more because we have to put the top on this, this uh, bath that we have and put a big insulating blanket to get it to heat up hot enough. And then after we do one, we have to cover everything back up, otherwise it just cools down too much. And if you try to bend stuff when it's too cool, some people who are new to it were doing that the other day, bending a few pieces, it just doesn't bend right. You have to get it hot enough. Next. Now the downside of the Depron is a great idea, you know, the Daedalus guys had to use the same kind of foam and they had a whole 24 foot truck worth of scrap pieces after they made their six inch thick leading edges out of that. We've got a few boxes of Depron that are like that high by this by this to make our entire leading edge. But it melts at a lower temperature and bends at a lower temperature than the, than the XPS foam. So it turned out we found we could, could not um, uh, basically tighten the mylar over it without totally scalloping and bending it. So now we're using this adhesive back mylar called Dural, Duralar on, on the uh, Depron, which is adding a couple pounds to the airplane um, in order to have a smooth surface. Uh, next. Uh, next, this is just building that test piece. Next. Next. And then this is building, back to building that full dummy uh, wing section to practice using aluminum so we don't waste good parts. Next. 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 It's pretty challenging. You have, you have a land of basically three millimeters on each side to get that Depron on, so you have to be really accurate with the alignment of these things, and every so often the, the spacing on each Depron sheet is 700 millimeters exactly. We'd get one that was off by more than a millimeter or so, and we'd have to make a special one that was a little bit wider, a little bit narrower. Next. Oh, wait, go back. This shows the Kevlar cross bracing. That's the step we're at with all the real wing parts now. We're getting that done, and we're gluing in the connection brackets at the end that ties everything together, and then we'll be ready for our load test. Next. 
we had to actually clean out all the release film on the inside and put these things called biscuits inside to prevent local buckling. If you think of a um, think of a Seven Up can before you pop it, it's really strong from the pressure inside. As soon as you pop it, if you take one of these cans you guys have drunk from, it's really easy to crush. Well, the carbon fiber is so strong that it can be very, very thin and light, but that means that it's susceptible to local buckling so that when you put it under bending stress, even though the, the spar cap is really strong, the rest of it can, can get a you know, crease in it as it turns into an oval, as it ovalizes, and then buckle locally. So these things are basically a mechanical block that we put every so often to prevent that from having yeah, shear webs. Right, exactly. And um, you can see this, we, we built this actually to learn how to do it blind, but not actually blind, being able to see what we're doing first before we did it blind in these things. But it actually shows it really well, right? This part can ovalize really easily, but the part that has the, um, has the is that typically how far apart they're, they're going to be? In? So the rule of thumb that we were told by the Arabello guys was um, four times the diameter. So our, Diameter was already 100 millimeters on the spar, and our rib spacing was 350 millimeters, so it's a little bit less than four times the diameter. And to increase the, they actually had done tests of the effectiveness of something on the outside versus the inside, and the outside was only about a third as effective at preventing buckling as on the inside. But it still helps some, so we actually spaced the biscuits in between the ribs so that, it, that the ribs are also helping some as well. So we're actually, doing a little bit tighter spacing than the recommendation, but on all the fuselage um, tubes and stuff, they're at 4x. Four, four and then I finally bothered to look on Google and try to find the paper about this, and it's way more complicated than 4x. I don't know where the four times the <laughs> diameter came up with, but it's just sort of a rule of thumb, which I hope works, because that's what we'd already built everything to. Next. This is just showing the building the biscuit process next, and testing that next showing how they're put in. This, this was Aravello's idea. It's basically, um, you put a syringe inside at the same time and the syringe fits in the middle of the biscuit so that instead of having to have two tools, one to put the glue way down inside the tube, pull that all the way out, and then something else to put the biscuit in, you can do both steps at once. There's a string attached to the syringe body in there and a stopper here, and then two holes where the string go around. And all the way on the other end, you reel it up on a spool and, and while somebody's turning this tube to leave a little spiral of glue and then you push the biscuit the last little bit in and smear the glue over it. Next, this is the process of biscuiting one of the tubes. Next, you can see a lot of biscuits in the front. For really small diameter tubes we use the rigid foam, um, so that's what those are. Next, and that's a bunch of those. These are going to get chopped up into four pieces and then just lathered up with epoxy and shoved down the tube. Next, this is showing making the seat. We copied a, um, a recumbent bike seat that was very comfortable, weighed about 850 grams, and we used much lighter gauge tubing, and, uh, very or smaller gauge tubing and very thin wall, and uh, made, got it down to about 350 grams. Next, next, and that's all lashed together. Next, and then we had a um, car upholstery manufacturer make a custom lightweight mesh for us. Next, I've already seen that. Next, this is the fuselage frame uh, before gluing. Next, and then the same technique of using a balsa wood plug. You actually use the tube itself as the cutter on the end grain balsa. Next, and then this is the fuselage. Uh, all lashed up. We don't. This joint isn't lashed yet because we're waiting to add the lift wire fitting. Next, those are just some more um, parts for the tail for the tail ribs. Next, that's one of those test tail sections. Next, then with the leading edge. Next, next. The way I'll go back the, uh, because the mylar we're using which is this really, really thin uh, 5 10 thousandths mylar, doesn't have any glue on it already like Monocoat does. Um, we use Pliobond on the, the wood, which you have to be really careful because it, it totally melts the foam, so we actually put 
put tape on the foam to protect it, put it on there and then let it dry and then strip the tape off. But that heat activates just like the glue on Monaco does. So it really is like making a model airplane where you're, you're just doing it on a gigantic scale. Next. And that's a finished test piece. Next. These are the V brackets that we use to uh, hold the tail surfaces on. Next. Next. That's, a, that's the test tail sections in our test rig. Next. Uh, this is all a bunch of parts for making the real tails. Next. This is a titanium piece. Bought a, some scrap titanium from Allen Steel. Carbon fiber galvanically corrodes with aluminum, so for the places where we um, use... Can you hand me that thing over there? This? Yeah. Carbon fiber galvanically corrodes with aluminum. Well, aluminum galvanically corrodes well, with like carbon fiber. <laughs> really? It happens over a long period of time, so... It, sorry. So it would probably be fine to glue it in there and leave it for a few years, but... Maybe this plane will last for 10 or 20 years, and I don't want it to all of a sudden fail. The fiberglass around it before it gets glued inside the rear spar and the front support tube. Mm -hmm. um, and here, what we did is we just used every... every so this is an aluminum spider, but it's bolted to the titanium piece, which is then in there. Uh, that's actually a titanium piece for the front bearing. Um, this is our prop shaft. So this part is fixed to the... Um, uh, Oh, what is that? I don't know. Oh, my oh. cotter pin wasn't in all the way. <clears throat> but that's okay, because I can show you this part of it. Uh, anyway, um, there's a, a bearing here, and then there's a thrust bearing here. Um, and, the, and those are all titanium, and they're very small parts. Um, my friend Wes, who did that fancy job on the aluminum piece there, he's got a four-axis mill and likes doing this stuff for fun, so um, we take advantage of that. Um, that this is just a way to be able to, if we prang a prop, just swap the prop out really quickly with this carbon fiber pin, which is supposed to have this cotter pin in it, preventing it from falling out, and obviously it would be eventually be bent over and probably also taped in place. Uh, so these are just representing the, you know, the six foot long prop blades on each side. Um, even with those teeny little stubs, it still makes a lot of wind. Next. That's the spider I showed you. Next. Next. So this is just showing the inside of this all getting glued up. Next. There's a bunch of carbon fiber gussets in there, and there's some, some uh, Nomex in there. This is the front bearing. Next. So we got what we think is the last tensilized mylar in the U.S., from Aurora, the place that Bob used to work. Um, they bought some to recover one of their human powered airplanes they were using for some UAV testing a few years ago from some place in China. You just can't get the stuff anymore. And so... What's special about it? Uh, it stretches more in one direction than the other when you tighten it. So in the long direction across, across the span of the wing, it stretches more and prevents scalloping. Mm. Honestly, I've used regular Mylar too, and I can't see that much difference. <laughs> um, uh, but it, it seems to work pretty well, and the Daedalus guys all swear by it and say that that's like a big secret to keeping the drag low is making sure you have as few wrinkles as possible. Mm. So Bob designed this um, uh, spooler thing that, that I built on his, based on his design, and then I went back there and we spool it off next. We had an interesting problem where the tapered part of the tube glued in the straight part of the main wing spar had a, uh, some excess glue came out on the joint and we couldn't get the biscuits past it. So we ended up putting a Dremel on a 24-foot <laughs> long kaluna tube and almost getting it all cut off because we'd already biscuited the other side and we couldn't try to hit it from the back side. And then we poked through by accident. But it didn't matter because we had two extra sets of wingtips, so we just switched to another one. And on the three others that had this problem, we, we hadn't biscuited them yet, so we were able to hit it off with an a aluminum pole from the back side. Next. That took about two weeks to screw around with them. Uh, yeah, we have to cut them with an abrasive cutter. Next. This is the 
40 meter span version of the airplane, the skeleton of the entire airplane taking up, I don't know, 13 or 14 parking spaces. Next. That's just another picture of the finished fuselage frame. Next. A lot of ribs getting ready to glue. Next. That's the uh, horizontal and vertical tail. All flying, no, no separate rudder and elevator flaps. It's just the whole thing moves before the trailing edge or leading edge is put on next. Does the leading edges next. Putting them on next. And then those are finished without covering next. And then we did, uh, then this is covering them. And we did take them separately. They were too, the vertical one was too tall to fit vertically, so we didn't test them together. We tested them separately, both in the horizontal position on the truck. Next. 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 This is all of the, um, all of the ribs for the tapered part of the wing. Next. And then we went back later to have practice on um, putting mylar on the full wing section with that test section. Next. And that's finished. Next. Uh, and now we're building, we basically in the last couple of days finished all the sections of the real wing to that point without the leading edge and covering on because we're going to be hanging all the weights from them on that load test on the 26th. Then once that load test is over, we're going to put the leading edges on and cover them and they'll be done. Next. So it's just more pictures of building stuff. Next. Are you including any twists into the wing? Like yes. Wash out? Yeah, so we have uh, a degree per meter of washout in the last two and a half um, meters of each wing. And then we actually continue the washout in that extra extended tip thing that's added on. Next. Uh, and the way we did that is we took, so this one, this shuck is cut out just flat, but on all the um, shucks on the taper part that are part of the washout, we actually cut the angle into the bottom of the shuck. And then, you know, pretty flat tables and we, um, clamp them in place to hold that in while, every, while the glue dries. So that actually has a degree and a half of twist in it. I don't know if it's that easy to see or not, because it's a little hard to see because the airfoil shape is also changing at the same time. Next. Next. Oh, go back. So yeah, this, this is about 10 pounds for an entire wing section. It's pretty light. Next, which it has to be pretty light if the whole airplane is going to be 80 pounds. Uh, and one thing that we just finished doing yesterday is stretching the lift wires, which are 80,000 thick piano wire, so that they aren't coiled up in a little coil like this. Now they're naturally wanting to be in a coil like this, and you're, we're able to handle them. That was a big deal. And we've also been labeling and marking 120 um, two-liter bottles, getting ready to put water in them. Next. And this is the pulling test. We did that at the back of the Hiller Museum the other day. Next. And this is before stretching and after stretching. Next. Uh, we're, we just had, we have a ton of people. We have 30 people working on the plane on Saturday. Um, a lot of new people that my friend uh, brought by. And so we cut out all these uh, quarter inch strips that we're going to use to laminate together in a quarter inch square with some carbon fiber on the outside to, to make the um, fuselage uh, ribs. Next. Uh, and then we made this laser alignment tool. That, it's a little bit fuzzy picture, but that let us cut out all the holes on all seven of the sections that we built um, for the, the Kevlar cross bracing, which we're just in the process of putting in. Next. And cut a bunch of leading edge sheets. Next. And as I mentioned before, we're doing sailplane training with all the really good athletes, none of whom are unfortunately uh, pilots. So now they're becoming pilots. So hopefully they'll be good enough pilots to not crash the airplane. Next. And that's the end of my presentation. I didn't really want to move it because it's the real part of the airplane and it's kind of delicate, but the prop is over there if you want to see it. And definitely pick up the uh, the tip extension. Oh, How much does this weigh? I haven't weighed that one yet. Um, How much? But it's probably like 
two or three hundred grams. I don't know, not very much. So how, how are you <coughs> joining the wind panels with the? Uh... So the, there's a sleeve, a carbon fiber sleeve. So the the um, pretend this was the full size spar. This is actually the thickest carbon fiber part we have, which is the bottom bracket for this, the, the cranks. <laughs> but uh, on the on the spar itself, it's got spar caps, but on the sleeve, it's got full unidirectional wrap all the way around, so it's a little bit stronger than the spar it's in. And it gets glued about two and a half diameters into one end, and then the other end slip fits into the other side. And then at the rear spar, so back here, um, We've got an aluminum piece with fiberglass around it to prevent galvanic corrosion. It's going to get glued in there. And then uh, we also have a support tube coming up here that another piece gets glued into. And those are sort of a clevis and tang kind of setup where one, one of the pieces has two pieces and the other one has one. And there's going to be a hole drilled through all three and then uh, a pin attached to each one. Um, and we designed them, like really over designed them so that pretending that the main spar isn't there, but really the main spar is what's going to be taking up most of the load. And the design load for that case is actually the case when you are landing and you stop abruptly and the wing, the weight of the wings is going forward. Are the, the, the cable is round? The cable? Yeah, 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 because there's just no good way to like have a fared cable and, and make sure that it stays fared and if it isn't in the right orientation and then it's worse than a round cable. So, yeah, I was wondering about that. So just make it round. And like I said, it's it's uh, eight watts a hit, but it saves us over 20 watts in terms of the weight of the plane. So you know, it would have been instead of a 36 kilogram or thereabouts plane, probably more, getting closer to 40 in reality. It would have been a 44, uh, or 44 to 48 kilogram airplane. If it was a completely cantilevered spar, and the spar would have had, you know, the, the spar cap being that thick, it would have been like that thick in the center. And the cable is what? It's uh, music wire. So, had you thought about using Kevlar? Does that make sense or anything? Or um, anything? Yeah, and you know, the um, I didn't show the video of the, of the team that I helped at that Korea competition. Uh, they flew this year. They had them last year. They were really happy. They used Dyneema. You know, there, there's a lot, of, which is like a sailing, uh, it's a braided but not very stretchy cable that it's used in like windsurfing and sailing and stuff these days, really fancy high-tech stuff. So how much that piano wire way? That's what I was curious about. Um, I forget, I got, I calculated it somewhere, but I forget how much it weighs. Pretty heavy stuff. Probably, yeah. I don't know, a couple hundred grams for each side of the lift wire. It's not that much. Um, Enough that it still pays off for itself. Yeah. Very small fraction of the of the spar weight that it's replacing. The, the, yeah. twist, the twist in the wing is, is really really controlled by the D two. I guess. You find yeah. So that well, what, what, the way we enough. did it, the way we did it is we, like I said, we set up this like like a jig by by mm -hmm. with the hot wire cutter cutter actually very accurately cutting in. The angle. Mm -hmm. I wish I, I should have some pictures showing that setup. Maybe actually in some of the pictures at the end it does show it. If you if you back up a couple photos, we might be able to see that. Uh, so it's jigged when you put the each. Right, and then and then you're gluing all these on there, so they're basically getting glued in place. So so basically we cut this in half, so it's just the bottom half, and then this is resting on that sure. at the right angle, and then um, keep going back. Back, 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 back. Uh, so you can see these guys sitting there. This was actually for a straight part, mm -hmm. so it didn't have any of them clamped on. Next, back, back. There you go. So these guys are all clamped on this side, and then we just, because this foam is kind of weak and tends to sag down, we just jammed the right thickness of thing underneath the backs to support it. And then these all get glued on one day, and then the next day we come back and we glue in the trailing edge. And by the time you have the trailing edge and the leading edge and the, the main spar or doubler glued in there, it's basically locked in. So you find that you get enough of it locked in even without the D2. Yeah, the yeah. The virtual stability is adequate. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> when we fly it. But it, it doesn't look like it's you know regressing or anything like that. 
I, one good question is we haven't done, it's, it's relatively easy to make the straight um, Depron panels for the three-fifths of the wing that's got constant cord, but we, you know, it's a more complicated shape you have to cut to fit the ones on the taper, and we haven't actually done that. And then when you get out to the part of the taper where you also have twist, I don't know if we're going to have any problems with, um, with wing shape. Worst case scenario, we might have to make half width things that only go from one rib to the other just so that we can, you know, approximate a straight thing. But I, I think the, the twist is so slight that that's not going to be a problem. Uh, yeah. I think we're, we're, close, we're getting right out of time, but do uh, you want to ask about the space question? Oh, yeah. So we just found out right before I left for Korea a couple weeks ago for that competition. Um, that we're getting kicked out of our space. We've, we've been lucky for for about half of the four years to have free space from Google, and the other half of the four years we haven't been able to work on the project because we haven't had free space. But now they need that space, and you know, they're growing like crazy. So um, we're getting kicked out at the end of this month, and we're almost done, but not quite. So we need some space. We have about 4,000 square feet of space now. It has to be about as, a free space about as long as this room, at least 24 feet and preferably 32 feet uh, to put one of our long tables. How come you can't use number 211 hangar in NASA where the Google puts their jets? Um, we've been trying really hard to do that, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Really? Yeah. It's no longer Ames Research Center, it's Google X and X. Yeah, the problem is that it's Google X and they don't want to put anybody else in there because they don't want people seeing their Google X stuff. And despite the fact that I worked at Google for nine years, they don't want me in there. So, How about where the U2s, or ER2s used to be? Uh, the little... Yeah, I'm, I'm trying the NASA angle, but so far I'm hitting a brick wall. So. <clears throat> what I'm looking for, even if I have to pay for something, the problem is I've looked around last year when we got kicked out of the previous Google space, but then luckily found a new one that um, around here, commercial real estate, you have to sign two or three year leases, and I need yeah. a place for about two or three months. Anything available on Hangar 2 or 3 on the other side of the field? Hangar 2 is where they're doing a bunch of Google X stuff that will help me in. Hangar 3, there isn't any space available. How big is how big space? Can you uh, right now we're in a 4,000 square foot space, so you could get away with probably a 2,000 square foot space. I was thinking of how, you know, how every Christmas and Halloween they come and they move into a store? Yeah, so I, just, a so I just went to the Spirit Halloween store that's a few blocks from my house over at Lawrence and Homestead. And the assistant manager there was really nice, but her boss didn't want to give me any help. D&J Hobbies, they moved out on Campbell Avenue and Santa Masakino. It's big. It's been empty for a long time. Oh, the old D&J. The old yeah. D&J. Yeah. It's empty. Okay, that's a great idea. And and they, they have been able to lease it. I mean, as far as I drive past it regularly. And but it's does pretty, the D&J own it, or does somebody else own it? No, the, the landlord that owns the facility, you know, the whole place. They moved to Westgate West. But I would check there because it's been empty quite a while. Yeah, and tell them you're just doing a two month thing or something or whatever. Right, I know, I know that um, you know, that they do this for these Halloween stores right. and other oh, seasonal I, stores. So there's got to be real estate agents that specialize in finding those things, but I haven't been able to find out. They do it for a month yet. and a half or, or two, two months. Two months, months or whatever. Or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, if anybody has any other ideas, I hope you have my card. And then. The other thing is, if it looks fun to you to help build a 110 wing, foot wingspan model airplane, um, <laughs> the whole point of this project is for fun. We're just doing it to learn and have fun. And uh, right now, we could use a lot of help getting as much finished as we can before we get kicked out. So if anybody wants to come by, we're basically Monday, Wednesday, Thursday at 4.30 p.m. It's, it's right on the Google campus, Saturdays at 10.30 and Sundays at 12.30. Um, you, do, you can just come, or um, you can send me an email if you're interested. If you're interested being on our mailing list, just send me an email, and I'll put you on the mailing list. That's how we tell people about what's coming up with build sessions and stuff, and I can send you directions on how to get there and all that kind of stuff. So I know you, usually when I t talk to modelers, they're and I also have given talks at like five EA places. People are all into building their own thing, but. Uh, if anybody's interested in even just coming for a tour, if you don't want to help building it, I'm, I'm happy to do that because that's the whole point of this thing is to kind of get these ideas out and uh, have fun. So. All right. All right. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. You're welcome.